So welcome to the keynote session of our fourth annual Religions and Practice of Peace uh, colloquium uh, dinner series. So I'm uh, David Hempton, Dean of the Divinity School. Um, so thanks to all of you for joining us tonight. It's great to see the um, uh, lecture theater full. Um, those of you who are attending for the first time, especially welcome. Uh, members of our cross-disciplinary RPP working group and sustainable peace working group, welcome. And colleagues and friends from across Harvard University and the local area, thank you all for being with us. We'd like to give special thanks to our guest speakers um, and participants, uh, Canon Sarah Snyder to my left, and Bishop Anthony Pogo, uh, just sitting here in the front, for traveling all the way to, uh, from London to be with us. Uh, still, um, I think we all travel from London at roughly from the same Juba, time. Actually. You from? From Juba. Yeah, yeah you came yeah. further on yeah. on road. So everyone has different time clocks now. So if we all fall asleep up here, just um, leave us alone. Um, 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 and we're uh, also grateful um, uh, to the co-sponsor of tonight's session, the program negotiation at Harvard Law School. Thank you for that. We'd also like to express our gratitude to RPP's generous supporters, including Reverend Karen Vickers Bud Budney and, and Al Budney, uh, Farley Armston and uh, Carl Bantle, and the Provostial Fund for the Arts and Humanities at Harvard University who have supported us. Um, uh, so thank you all, all of those individuals uh, and groups for helping uh, make these activities possible. And thank you especially to the RPP team for their work in organizing this event, indeed everyone who's played a part in um, um, uh, making this event possible. Thank you for your hard work. So in the light of the polarization, violence, and threats of violence in this country and around the globe, and the scale of the underlying inequities and injustices that contribute to these conditions, we are more and more grateful every day to be part of our growing RPP community of people from across disciplines and backgrounds who are committed to working together through engagement, scholarship, and practice towards a more humane, equitable, and harmonious world. No matter our profession or our affiliations or walk of life, um, the urgent challenge of coming together to work towards sustainable peace in our human family is one in which each of us has a great deal at stake, and each of us has much of value to contribute. As some of you know, uh, this academic year, uh, in RPP, we've begun incubating a sustainable peace initiative with students, faculty, fellows, and alumni intended to catalyze and support one Harvard efforts for su sustainable peace right across the university and beyond. So reaching out to um, all of the other Harvard schools, the, um, uh, the universities in the greater Boston area, and of course beyond that. Among the questions we're exploring are, how do people envision peace and what is needed to make peace substantive, shared, and sustainable? How can we undertake efforts for sustainable peace that are sufficiently holistic to address the manifold dimensions and complexities of destructive conflict, violence, and peace building, from the personal and spiritual to the institutional and the structural? How can we develop efforts for sustainable peace that address the roots of destructive conflict and violence while benefiting from the millennia of wisdom for peace practice in our spiritual, ethical, and cultural traditions? How do we dig deep into those? How can we mainstream sustainable peace as an integral goal of leadership across sectors, much as is increasingly being done, for example, with the goal of environmental sustainability? And how can we leverage the regular activities of our communities and organizations to advance our goals proactively in strategic and innovative ways? What skills and arts of leadership, collaboration, and creativity can empower us in, this, in these efforts? An excellent contemporary example of a leader, an institution, and a community who are already doing precisely what we are proposing in the Sustainable Peace Initiative, and uh, making work for sustainable peace and integral to what they are doing, is the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, the Church of England, and the Anglican Communion worldwide. Upon becoming Archbishop, Justin Welby made reconciliation one of the three main uh, areas of focus of his ministry establishing a reconciliation ministry whose mission is to reimagine the church as a reconciling presence in a world of conflict. So the Anglican Communion um, uh, has um, 
um, set out on this path as one of its top priorities for the years ahead. So as I know from uh, personal experience in Northern Ireland, both during the Troubles and Sins, reconciliation goes well beyond formal peace agreements and, and sometimes doesn't happen at all quickly. Uh, um, so how communities that have been so long and so deeply divided and that have experienced such painful harms and losses can shift towards more positive relationships in ways that are healing, meaningful, meaningful and enduring is among our human family's most difficult questions and one in which religious communities and leaders certainly have an important role to play. So we're honoured and delighted to have with us as this year's uh, keynote speakers tonight, uh, Canon Sarah Schneider, who heads up the Archbishop's Reconciliation Ministry, and her colleague in the field, uh, Bishop Anthony Pogo. So thank you so much, both of you, for making a long trip to be with us. I'll just say, uh, give uh, two very brief bios uh, of our guests. Uh, so Canon Sarah Schneider, uh, PhD, is the Archbishop of Canterbury's Advisor for Reconciliation. This role has a particular emphasis on supporting the Anglican Church in contexts of violent conflict or post-conflict and helping the Church to be an agent of reconciliation and conflict transformation. A theologian who specializes in Jewish, Christian, Muslim relations, Canon Schneider brings wide-ranging international experience of peace building and dialogue over many years. She has worked uh, to promote faith-based rec reconciliation most recently as Director of Partnerships with Religions for Peace International, an organization affiliated with the United Nations. Canon Snyder has also directed the Cambridge International Summer Schools for Faith Leaders from Conflict Zones. A trained mediator, she has experience both of working with communities and with senior religious leaders around the world. She is the founding director of the Rose Castle Foundation, it's a great name, an international center of reconciliation based in the north of England, offering safe space in which to address misunderstanding of the other, particularly those of different religious traditions. Located in beautiful Cumbria, it is a peaceful haven in which to transform conflict within and between faith communities and to train up a generation of leaders equipped as faith-based mediators. This is a very central component of, um, of what they're trying to do. Um, Bishop Anthony uh, Pogo is the advisor for Anglican Communion Affairs to the Archbishop of Canterbury. But before moving to London in October 2017 to accept this position, uh, Bishop Anthony spent nine years as diocesan bishop of uh, Kajio Keji, South Sudan, serving one of the most challenging provinces in the Anglican Communion. Throughout his ministry, Bishop Anthony has served as both teacher and pastor engaging with the profound issues faced in many parts of the communion where famine, war, and violent ethnic tensions have destabilized society and created a large number of refugees. He worked for six years with Scripture Union in Sudan and Uganda and after obtaining his Master of Theology degree in 1994. In 2012, he was awarded an honorary doctorate for his role in mobilizing the church and service of the community, and he has various publications to his name including this book, uh, Come Let Us Rebuild, which he will um, uh, be signing some copies of at the end if you would like to pick one up. So welcome, thanks so much for being with us. So the plan uh, for the, this evening is to, um, um, for me to shut up very quickly and allow um, uh, uh, Sarah Schneider to speak. And then um, we'll invite uh, uh, Sarah and Bishop Anthony to uh, join us at the front and um, we'll have a little bit of a, a, a round table um, discussion then. And then it'll be open to all of you to um, um, uh, ask questions, make your contributions. Um, um, so, we, uh, so that's the, the plan. And then there'll be a, a time for um, uh, refreshment and uh, general socializing at the end. So um, I think without further ado, I am gonna ask um, Sarah Schneider to come and speak to us. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for uh, having us. Uh, Bishop Anthony and I have never had such wonderful hospitality, apart from when we're in South Sudan, when we have the same. Uh, we've eaten beautifully, we've uh, 
had lots of wonderful cups of tea, which we appreciate, and uh, you've just looked after us beautifully. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for coming. You know, I look out at all these faces and wish that you were doing the talking here and we could learn from you because you'll all be coming with all this wisdom and experience of handling conflict um, and thinking about conflict from within different traditions. So uh, please hear from me that, that actually it should be the other way around. I'm going to talk for um, maybe about half an hour, but I'll try and keep it very uh, colourful with lots of pictures and then we'll have time to hear from you afterwards. Um, so this is actually... Uh, from uh, rewinding right back to the beginning uh, of my uh, uh, introduction, if you like, to mediation, when uh, I'd just come out of university, I'd met my husband, we were both anthropologists, and we went out to northern uh, Mali, we were in the Sahara Desert, and we were living with a, a nomadic group called the Tuareg, who are descendants of the Berber. And at the time, they were engaged in a conflict with the Malian government, uh, who wanted to settle them, and in the uh, environment in which they were living, uh, which is a very harsh environment, they uh, couldn't settle. Uh, and, and in fact, those who did try to settle with their cattle uh, came into huge conflict with the Fulani agriculturalists. And the other thing that was going on there was that the different groups who were in Mali, there were 66 different people groups all in this area that you'd imagine was pretty empty, being desert, but wasn't. Um, they all had uh, either Christian or Muslim or traditional African uh, religious identities. And those identities form quite a key part of how they presented themselves when they were in conflict. So it was a very early introduction, this was during the 80s, uh, to the religious aspect of conflict. Um, what we were actually doing was responding, my husband and I, to pictures like this, horrendous pictures on our television screens at the time, um, because it was a time of severe famine. And children in the West were growing up with this uh, slightly um, warped idea that somehow the West was the savior and these poor people out in Africa needed us. It was a one-way kind of um, traffic, if you like. And of course, they did need us. They needed our funding and they needed our support. Uh, but we wanted to uh, balance some of those pictures with uh, the gifts that the West needed from these people. Uh, there was so much. Look at this picture. Uh, this was from a similar time, actually. Uh, very different context, but a similar time. And there was a lot that we wanted to return back in terms of the pictures and the stories of uh, the cultures of the people that we were living with. So that was our starting point. And I'll now try and keep description, not, uh, not prolong you any longer. Um, so in the desert, actually, I wanted to start by talking about hospitality. In a physically hostile environment, a stranger on the horizon signals news of the outside world. And at the time we were there, mobile phones didn't exist, so it was literally a kick of dust on the horizon. And you would actually run to greet the people who were passing by uh, because you wanted news of the outside world. But there's no way of telling whether they would be stranger or foe, uh, whether the stranger would be a friend or a foe. So a long-standing tradition of social etiquette kicked in, the practice of hospitality. In return for providing much needed food, water, shelter, and protection, the visitor would follow the expected norms of a guest. They respected their host, accepted their hospitality, <coughs> shared news, and frequently resources before carrying on on their journey. Pragmatically, you might say, hospitality is integral to the formation of good relationships. It's an often overlooked part of the peacekeeping toolkit in today's world in which hospitality is more of a commercial transaction. A counterpart etymologically to hospitality is hostility. I was shocked when I heard a European, a senior European politician, close their doors to Syrian refugees with the excuse, we're a Christian country and we need to protect our Christian identity. It's precisely because of their Christian identity that they would welcome and protect the homeless and the stranger. And of course, the same would go for any country living by its values. Hospitality to strangers is a fundamental and widely recognized virtue. Here's the Trojan horse, and a memorable example of the violation of hospitality. And here are the French inhabitants of Le Chambon. You may well know the story of these people who were willing to take enormous risks in welcoming and protecting strangers in this case, Jewish refugees during the time of the Holocaust. 
over many, many years in the field, and I've traveled in so many different uh, situations of conflict, I've been welcomed by some very unlikely communities. I've also observed the fluidity and the mutuality of host and guest relations. When I think I'm hosting a mediation, I discover I'm actually the guest at their table. And I really believe this willingness to be both guest and host at different points is a vital tool in mediating conflict and building sustainable peace. Westerners, we Westerners, have even greater need to learn how to be guest, not host, to enter the space of those outside our comfort zone, to listen to their side of the story, to step into their shoes for a little while and even to see ourselves through their eyes before stepping back into our own comfortable and different shoes once again. This is actually a family in, uh, the, in uh, uh, the West Bank um, who had gone through a particularly traumatic period at the time um, and they were the ones being accused of uh, being the offender in this particular situation. Uh, whereas in fact when you sit with them and you see the uh, family album and the number of people who are lost no longer living from that family album, you hear a very different story. The offender there is also the victim in that situation. So Bishop Anthony and I uh, and Archbishop Justin uh, work primarily in situations of conflict including most recently a lot of work in South Sudan. And we coll collaborate closely with the churches in this current role uh, and with also other churches and other faith traditions. We recognize that lasting peace is only possible through the willingness of conflicted parties to work together for the common good. It's uh, Archbishop Justin here in South Sudan. And then I think there's a picture here of uh, the Archbishop of South Sudan, uh, Daniel Deng, holding the hands of the, two, the president and the leader of the opposition. Uh, that would not be possible right now but it was, it was possible, and he played a key role uh, at different times, as has his church, the Anglican Church, as have all the churches in South Sudan, in negotiating uh, the very rocky peace process that, uh, is continuing to, um, that is continuing in South Sudan. In fact, the United Nations now says the church is the only organization left in South Sudan uh, that has access um, to the communities where they no longer are able to go, so it's playing a, a very critical role. So, what is reconciliation? Um, it's a journey, not a goal. Humanly speaking, it's a process by which individuals and communities move from a divided past to a shared future. Not a perfect future, and not a future that forgets the past, but one that learns from the past and works hard to prevent that past causing future conflict. I sometimes describe it as moving people who are back to back, here I'll take my glass so I can't see you with those on, moving people who are back to back, face to face, putting the face back on one another, that's a painful process, a very, very painful process. But you don't stay staring at each other. You need then to turn outward. You need to be able to look at the wider community in which you live and to work out ways that you can serve that wider community, serve the common good, shoulder to shoulder. You don't want to be the same, you want to retain your differences, but you do want to have a common goal, and that is serving the wider good. And what can happen in that process is you end up covering each other's back. You have a very different kind of back-to-back -back where you're actually looking out for one another. Um, and that's a, a, an idealized picture of what we do, but nevertheless, that's the kind of process that we're looking for in all the reconciliation that we're working at, whether it's with, between individuals or whether it's between communities. Um, reconciliation is much more than the absence of conflict. Politicians often focus so hard on achieving the ceasefire, they forget about the long journey beyond. Faith leaders, and uh, that includes the church at the moment uh, in our work, are very well placed to lead that onward journey. They are the ones present on the ground before, during, and after conflict. They have a long-term perspective, or they should do, that outlasts shifting political agendas. And when I talk about the role of the faith communities, I'm very aware that there are many individual faith leaders who violate that. Um, so I'm not again painting a perfect picture of faith leaders, but I am saying that they have a very different function to the NGOs, to the UN and to uh, 
uh, others who are catapulted in during conflict and to reach a ceasefire, but don't have that long continuity that the faith communities have. The reality is that after a ceasefire, most survivors, including fighters, do remain or return home. Former enemies live in close proximity. And whilst coexistence, even tolerance, might be possible, the roots of bitterness continue to grow. Establishing post-conflict mechanisms for reconciliation is vital to stop communities falling back into ongoing cycles of hatred and violence. So these uh, post-conflict mechanisms might include public acts of truth-telling, retributive and restorative justice, reparation of past wrongs, and the corporate healing of memories. I'm going to talk about some of these later. Um, part of all of this is a collective reimagining of a future together. And actually, there's a big role for the arts as well that kicks in there. Um, a third point about reconciliation, very obvious, is that it is a long and emotionally costly process. There are no quick fixes. Um, very often, when I was working with the UN, you had a tick box exercise that was really forcing you into um, you know, ticking off when you'd sorted particular problems. And actually, you knew that those situations weren't ticked off. They were going to raise their head again quite quickly. Um, and reconciliation is about that longer perspective, a much, much longer perspective. And again, faith communities are well placed for that because they have, on the whole, a longer perspective in terms of their ideology. Um, so reconciliation seeks healing for the survivors of conflict, both victims and, in appropriate ways, offenders. In the midst of conflict, it's very easy to cast humanity in neat black and white binaries. In reality, victims can go on to become offenders, and offenders themselves are very often victims, either now or in the past. Ideally, reconciliation supports both victims and offenders in breaking the chains of the past, whether that's done separately, very often it has to be done separately for security and safety, uh, or whether it's done together. So number four is that reconciliation seeks to break ongoing cycles of violence and revenge. It challenges negative prejudices, attitudes, and stereotypes that justify continued hatred and violence towards others, not just between former combatants, but including everyone in the family that's impacted by the conflict. It's really easy to ignore, to fight, or to destroy our enemy when they have no face. In fact, during battle, Many soldiers cannot afford to look at the face of their opponents, or it might cause a moment's hesitation and put themselves or their comrades at risk. The human face is both vulnerable and incredibly powerful. At one of our Cambridge summer schools, where we, uh, every year we would have Israelis and Palestinians together, one of the first observations of Rafat, who I'm going to talk about later, a Palestinian, was this. I never knew that Israelis smile. And why would he know that? Because he'd only ever seen Israelis at uh, um, checkpoints or on television screens. And of course, nobody's in a smiling mood at a checkpoint. And generally on the television screens uh, in the West Bank, uh, the, it's a formal situation that they're in. So he's not observing smiling. He'd never actually seen Israelis smile. And he did at the Cambridge Summer School on the very first evening. And that that challenged some of the perceptions that he had. Uh, the same danger of defacing our opponents applies at every level, whether between nations or communities, individuals, or even factions on a university campus. We adopt language like, they always do this, they're not like us, they're out to get us. This is the language of conflict. The process of reconciliation challenges these generalizations and works very hard to rehumanize the other, to see the face of those we've written off. Uh, faith communities, indeed, uh, most, most people um, here, I would say, have quite a lot to say about this idea of rehumanizing. Uh, we have a deep understanding of the dignity and worth of every human being. I believe that every person is made in the image of our creator God. Subsequently, an affront on another individual is an affront on God himself. Similarly, welcoming the stranger is like welcoming God himself. 
Others come to similar conclusions about our intrinsic worth, but through a different lens. The 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights reflects Immanuel Kant by saying, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Reconciliation, I believe, seeks that spirit of sisterhood and brotherhood. So the word reconciliation means bringing together what has been torn apart. What is that quote? Yeah, the word reconciliation, uh, bringing together what has been torn apart, healing what has been broken. In many communities, there's actually no memory of a before scenario. Bishop Anthony will tell you that in South Sudan, violence is all they've ever known in this generation. Yet as a Christian, and I'm sure for many of you, I do believe there is a meta-narrative, even in situations of long-term, ongoing violence. There is substance to the hope that one day, all people, indeed all creation, will be reconciled. The New Testament letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verse 20, tells us that through Christ, God reconciled to himself all things, everything on earth and in heaven, by making peace through the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. This is a holistic peace, not peace based on everything being robotic or the same. It describes a reality in which humans, and indeed all of creation, can flourish in and through its diversity, not just coexist. Will we ever see that this side of heaven? Well, we had a glimpse here. This is one of the Cambridge summer schools. Um, perhaps we won't see it in full, this side of heaven, but nevertheless, it's worth striving for. So reconciliation occurs at every level of our experience. Individually, we witness reconciliation within family, between friends and colleagues, neighbors, and at times between victim and offender. Likewise, we see reconciliation between communities, institutions, warring factions, and nations. We see glimpses of reconciliation between humanity and our environment. In our work with leaders of warring factions, I invariably discover they themselves are impacted by conflict and division in other parts of their life, whether personally, communally, or institutionally. And of course, there's a huge link between environmental um, destruction, where there is no reconciliation with the environment, and the instance of conflict. Which reminds us that there is also significant work to be done within the human heart, tackling the trauma of conflict. Faith communities are well-placed to support much of this healing work. They live and work at the heart of their communities. They actually are the community, standing with them well beyond the ebb and flow of peace workers. The South Sudanese churches have a deep credibility and trust built through decades of journeying through war and conflict. This is Archbishop uh, or Bishop um, Paride Tupan, who recently won uh, one of our awards for his uh, work in peace building in South Sudan. And he uh, is an example of a faith leader who has the ear of the president, which is difficult in South Sudan at the moment, not many faith leaders do, um, but who also is very, very active in his own community. So he straddles that, that track one level right down to the grassroots level. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly touch on a biblical lens for reconciliation and then get very practical, hopefully. Uh, so I would understand God as the author and sustainer of reconciliation and heaven as the realization of reconciliation in full. Nevertheless, the process of reconciliation is something that we strive for now and every day despite considerable challenges and setbacks. Every time as Christians that we say the Nicene Creed, we're reminded that the church is one of all nations, languages and tribes declaring a shared belief in one holy, Catholic, small c, and apostolic church. This is in fact a picture of a reconciled people. It's not a uniform church in which all are the same, but it's a united church in which all come together and celebrate their multiplicity. Jesus recalled his own Jewish tradition when reminding us to love God, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. He went on, some would say radically, to command us to love our enemies. Plato defined justice apparently as treating friends well and enemies badly. But Jesus spoke against any notion of an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. 
He called for a code of practice that goes well beyond revenge, recognizing that our own flourishing is intricately bound to the flourishing of others. And I love this picture here because he looks really like a jihadi rather than Jesus. Um, and it just shows how we have so many stereotypes that are put into our minds. We see a picture or we see a person and we jump to a conclusion. Uh, and in fact, those stereotypes are, are put upon us, really, uh, not just by the media, but by others around us. So um, when Jesus talks about enemies, one of the things I often like to think about is uh, the, the greatest enemy for many people, including many um, leaders of violence, and that is the enemy inside, the enemy within ourselves. Um, and a lot of the work we do uh, in reconciliation is starting in that place, uh, dealing with the enemy, the wounded spirit within the person who is responsible for violence. Because until you, you can engage with that wounded spirit, you're not going to see any immediate change in that person in terms of the ongoing cycle of violence. So um, over the years of, of uh, seeing um, reconciliation, seeing mediation, seeing peace building in different situations of conflict, uh, I've detected various patterns, rhythms, things that seem to come up again and again in the process of reconciliation. And I'm going to share those with you now, not as a set framework, this is how you do it, because it's not how you do it. Um, it's very contextual and it's very cyclical. It depends. It, you know, it's always going backwards and forwards. But I just thought it might be helpful to share with you eight different aspects of reconciliation that I've noticed. Um, so the first one is about convening a safe space. And apparently in America we can't say safe space because that means you can't talk about religion. Is that right? So that's not the safe space I mean. I mean a space where you can talk about religion if you want to. In fact, you can talk about whatever you need to talk about. Um, but you talk about what you need to talk about in a facilitated space uh, and a space where not only you are talking, but those who you don't really want to hear also have a voice. So that, that's the kind of safe space that I'm talking about. <coughs> religion is sometimes blamed as a cause of violence, but religion and its adherents also hold the keys to restoration of moral order. <coughs> the churches in South Sudan provide a safe space, here's one of them, to express, uh, for people to express pain and cry out for justice. Many community mediation meetings involve heated exchanges, tears, and anger. You only need to look at the Psalms to know that the Bible engages frankly with this kind of pain and suffering. It encourages us, or they encourage us, to believe that God hears our lament and our appeals for justice. Many faith communities straddle tribal and other divisions and they usually have trusted communal spaces in which people can physically gather. Respected faith leaders, and I say respected because not everybody is, are well-placed to open up and host cross-border encounters in which opposing groups can meet face-to-face -face and in which every person in that group has a voice. But they don't stop at talking. The doing together is just as important. And here's one really simple but profound form of encounter it's actually the meal table. And in many cultures, you can't eat a meal with your enemy. So the very act of sitting around doesn't need to be fancy, like this one. This happens to be the Cambridge Summer School. Um, it can be uh, you know, on the floor, sitting, as I've often done, uh, in a circle, eating with people who have uh, previously been fighting one another. And that act of eating together is something very sacred. Um, likewise, community events, social, sporting, etc., help um, begin to, to put the face back on the enemy, help begin to overcome fear and establish relationships of trust. So the second, I don't know who that is, can't remember. Oh yes, yes, I, I know who that is, I meant why is it here, but it's, uh, this is Archbishop David Guitari from Kenya. But he's here because he's talking about breaking the cycle of revenge. So faith leaders have, this is the second point, breaking the cycle of revenge, that endless cycle that lies behind uh, conflict. Faith leaders have a public platform or a pulpit from which to speak. Um, they are present in their communities, as we've said, before, during, and after conflict, and are usually trusted more than the politicians or the armed forces or the UN. Faith leaders have the authority to persuade their people not to seek revenge, 
or to return violence with violence. This doesn't mean letting others trample all over them, but rather it identifies non-violent means of response. So there is a response, but it's a non-violent response. It's not using the same tactics that your enemy uses. Uh, these are actually army chaplains. We've been doing a lot of work with army chaplains, um, challenging some of the culture of violence within the armed forces in South Sudan. And they are well placed to address the moral disorder uh, that um, is very manifest in uh, some of the troops up there. Here we have um, a friend of mine, Sami Awad. Has anybody met Sami? Quite well known in this field here yeah, um, of nonviolent communication. Uh, so Sami is um, executive director of the Holy Land Trust in Bethlehem. He's Palestinian. Mother is from Gaza. Father became a refugee from his home in West Jerusalem in 1948. Uh, Sami has lived in the Israel-Palestine conflict all his life, but was profoundly impacted by a visit to the Nazi concentration camps in Germany. He realized that the suffering of his enemy was profound. He'd never ever considered the suffering of his enemy. And that experience in those uh, concentration camps uh, brought him back to his home context with a different lens. He's still <coughs> Palestinian. He doesn't suddenly love the Israelis, uh, but he does come up, he has got now a philosophy of nonviolent response uh, that he uh, has influenced many, many people in his community and actually internationally uh, with. Here's somebody else. Oh, that's, that's Sami's on the, uh, his refrain on his booklet. Here, um, I'm actually with a farmer in Bethlehem here called Dawood, and his family have farmed this little hilltop uh, for generations, for about four generations. And we're looking out at a new um, settlement that's being built, a Jewish settlement in this case, and in fact, every single hill around his hill has got a Jewish settlement on it. So he feels quite um, isolated on this little hilltop with his family. He grew up actually in a cave on this hill, uh, which is where they, they, they go for protection. Um, and the cave was actually their home. It's also cooler, of course, than living out on the top here where it's very hot. Uh, but he um, is growing oranges and apples and has actually turned this little farm into an international peace center for young volunteers called the Tent of Nations. And he does not have hatred in his heart for his neighbors. He's doing some extraordinary work building bridges uh, with those who are around him. And those are quite extreme bridges that he's uh, able to build there. So he is not, and he's had uh, many attacks on his land. And in fact, um, the houses have all been removed on this land because they're under demolition order because he's not supposed to be staying where he is uh, any longer on this hilltop. But uh, still, he responds without a violent response. Um, he responds with a non-violent response. So it's possible, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's possible in really, really challenging environments. This is some of his apples that are del absolutely delicious, so sweet. So the third um, uh, pattern that I've noticed is around the need to break the chain between victim and offender. Um, victors and offenders often develop very unhealthy chains of bondage, one to the other, in which their identity is formed by the other's actions or responses towards them. On the victim's part, this can include deepening anger and bitterness or self-pity. On the offender's part, it can manifest in manipulation and ongoing abuse of power or agonizing feelings of remorse. Whilst it's not always appropriate to physically bring victims and offenders together, reconciliation includes the need to let go of the power or grip of the other. For example, no longer somebody's victim, but a survivor. <coughs> Forgiveness and repentance are powerful tools for enabling this process, as are other programs for victim-offender communication. But there are many times when people cannot forgive, um, or they don't feel remorse. And uh, so there are other strategies that we, we, we bring in um, to try and break this pattern, uh, this chain of victim-offender relationship. Um, I was engaged in a really interesting program in Belfast called Swords into Plowshares, um, uh, based on the Isaiah 2, uh, verse 4. Uh, this was hosted by the East Belfast Mission, and it included Israeli and Palestinian faith leaders with Northern Irish former paramilitaries, Republican and Loyalist. Uh, they listened carefully and painfully to one another's experiences of conflict. And by listening to another's conflict, it opened new windows on their own conflict. And they began to recognize the cycles of retaliation and alienation they were each caught up in. 
and to see their own part in continuing those cycles. They began to realize new ways. Oh, no, they, first of all, they began to realize the ways in which they, without even realizing it, pass on the wounds of the past to the younger members of their communities, usually with devastating consequences. That's an example where it takes somebody else's conflict to recognize our own responsibility in our own conflict. Um, the fourth uh, pattern uh, is all around rebuilding mutual trust. Uh, this is actually the Mother's Union in Africa. And I don't know what the Mother's Union is like here, but uh, in Africa, it's massive. Almost every uh, married woman um, is a member of the Mother's Union. And uh, they have enormous influence in their communities. So part of, obviously, uh, building trust is the ability to recognize shared humanity in the face of another. Uh, to see the face of one's enemy and to rehumanize them is the first vital step towards building trust. This usually requires a painful separation of person and deed. No individual is fully defined by their actions, however horrific. And likewise, no community can be categorized by the actions of some within that community. So breaking down sweeping generalizations and negative stereotypes is a critical stage in the journey towards reconciliation. We've actually, uh, looking at this picture, started a program called Women on the Front Lines of Conflict. Um, and we're working with women in uh, situations of conflict who are um, ordinary women who are peace builders in their community. Very often we, we talk about women being the victims of violence, and they are, uh, but they are also the first to spot rising tension, the first to act to diffuse that tension, and very often the ones looking after the, con the victims of uh, conflict. So we're really um, doing a lot of work to support them and to try and energize them, mobilize them, um, and encourage them in the work that they do. It sounds so simple, but it's really profound for these women as well, just knowing that somebody cares about them and somebody has noticed the way in which they are acting as peace builders on the front line. Um, the fifth, we'll just move on. That's one of the women. Um, building empathy, listening to the other. Meeting face to face with people is of course not enough. There needs to be opportunity to tell our story and most importantly, to be heard when we tell our story. Something powerful happens when we hear the stories of our enemies. We not only glimpse some, something of them we had previously misunderstood, whatever it might be, but we also begin to see ourselves through their eyes. We realize that they might, in fact, see us as offenders. This process of growing empathy uh, across quite stark lines of conflict is not about becoming like each other or even needing to like each other. Rather, it's about understanding more of the differences between us and seeking new ways to bridge those differences. It's not trying to become like-minded, but it's seeking shared ways. It's that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder move, um, finding unity here, but not uniformity. Um, we put this to the test here in one of our Cambridge summer schools. We, uh, uh, it, this is a really profound thing that happened, actually. A Hoover here, um, in the, remember the IDF, Israeli. Uh, she asked one of the Palestinian participants if she could experience what it was like to actually wear the full niqab. And the Palestinian um, allowed her to borrow her clothes and to wear them. And we were actually going on a weekend trip to Birmingham. And Ahuva decided to, to, uh, to wear, including the niqab, to wear uh, the hijab the whole trip throughout Birmingham. So she walked out in the streets dressed like this. And normally, she's an extremely... Um, well-dressed lady and actually doesn't wear, um, she doesn't cover herself particularly well. I kept having to tell her during the summer school, could she you know, slightly remember to wear slightly longer skirts and slightly longer sleeves? Um, but she noticed some profound things that happened to her when she was tra walking around Birmingham. One of the funny things that she noticed was that if she didn't like someone or if somebody brushed past her, because uh, she's quite, a, quite a, a feisty woman, she could stick her tongue out and nobody would know. <laughs> so it's just a little thing that... Um, <laughs> but she also felt invisible and she wasn't sure that she liked that feeling. She realized a lot of, a lot of her way of um, being in the world is being noticed and she suddenly felt that she wasn't being noticed. 
and that, that really made her look at her Palestinian friend with new eyes again. Um, everybody, in the end, decided they wanted to have the same experience. So these, apart from me, these are all uh, Israelis. This is, a, uh, in fact, a rabbi from New York. Um, uh, but they, uh, they all decided they wanted to experience getting into the shoes, in this case, the clothes of the other. Um, and it may sound very trite, but it had a profound influence not only on, on the Israelis, but on their Palestinian friends who were so moved by the fact that they showed an interest, they wanted to experience what it was like. So That's just two of them out in Birmingham. Um, Rafat here, I mentioned Rafat earlier. Um, he's the one who'd never seen the Israeli smile. Uh, at the summer school, we do a lot of storytelling, and it's quite hard storytelling. And he um, was listening to one of those... Uh, one of the Israeli members of the IDF talk about her story of losing her sister on the front line. Um, she lost her sister serving in West Bank, which is where Rafat lives. And uh, she herself, this um, Israeli at the program, was pregnant. And she was really rethinking what kind of future she wanted for her child. And Rafat was sitting listening to her um, uh, through a whole new lens. He had never thought about um, the, the, the possibility that soldiers might be afraid when he was dealing with them. He was the one who was afraid. He hadn't realized they would be afraid. Um, he also then told his story, which was that he and his family own a block of flats, a little block of flats um, that houses students from the nearby university. Uh, and one night, the soldiers came in, to, rapping on the door of their home, pulled out his father and his brothers, um, and told them that there was a terrorist being ha ha uh, housed in this block of flats and asked them to go in and evacuate the flats. So they went in, they pulled out all the students from bed, got them all outside. Terrorist wasn't there amongst the group. So Rafat's brother was sent back in, uh, in front of uh, one of the soldiers, like in front of him, like a shield, and they went up to search every single room. And then the soldier came down, leaving his brother, telling him to go up and check the roof, and they blew up the block of flats, so he, his brother died. Um, and when Rafat was telling this story, Lana, that, that pregnant um, lady who was there, started to cry uncontrollably. Um, and she said, she said, what he's saying is actually true. That's what we do. That's what we're taught to do. We'll put somebody in front of us to protect us, because nobody will attack us if we've got a Palestinian in front of us. And she said, I've never um, thought of that Palestinian as being Rafat, you know, as being a person. And of course, she couldn't think that way because, again, she would have put her colleagues at risk. So this is some of the reality that we're dealing with. But putting the face back on somebody is, 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 is very profound. Here, um, we are experiencing different faith traditions uh, through the eyes of the community. This is an Orthodox Jewish community. First time any of these people had ever walked into a synagogue. And there was real fear amongst some of them. In fact, they weren't sure they were even allowed to walk into a synagogue. Um, but uh, they were so welcomed by the members of the synagogue that they did, in fact, go in and they were able to look at the scrolls and to hear about what it means for an Orthodox Jew to read scripture. So just some of the ways of crossing borders and beginning to build empathy. Um, I'll just show you this picture quickly. Oh, there, that one. So this um, is Rafat, and this is Lana, who's the uh, lady who's now had her baby, um, the Israeli who was pregnant. And this is Haney, who's um, a uh, priest from northern Egypt. And his church was burnt down by extremists. And uh, subsequently, the Muslim community protect the Christians when they go to church every Sunday. So there's been some interesting work happening there. But at the end of just a short period of time in the same space, uh, these two particularly, Rafat and Lana, were able to... Um, to to see, not only to put the face back on each other, but to write a song of peace that they subsequently played, which is what they're doing here. But very moving to see the change that can happen quite quickly. We can dehumanize people very fast, and we can rehumanize people pretty fast. We have an amazing capacity to do both. So um, number six I've got to, I hope you have two. I was actually just gonna touch on Truth and Reconciliation um, Commissions. We can come back to this. Uh, Later on, maybe I will, I'll skip, skip beyond that. Okay. Survivors of conflict, uh, both victims and offenders, are traumatized physically, emotionally, mentally, and physically. 
Left unnoticed, trauma finds new outlets in future. And I just want to touch briefly on the role of memory, which so powerfully defines us individually and collectively. Trying to ignore or cover up past suffering cannot lead to sustainable peace, even though it can be tempting to keep a tight lid following a, uh, on, on, on memory following a ceasefire, for example, in Cambodia. In some cases, like in the 80s in South America, those responsible for violence impose a kind of forced amnesia of the past. This actually prevents reconciliation and severely threatens sustainable peace. Justice is denied, and a shallow coexistence between victims and offenders rarely survives very long. In other cases, too great an emphasis on the past can perpetuate anger and division and prevent the healing of former wounds. So there's some balance that's got to be struck there. Memory is, of course, selective and partial. Memory and history that goes with it is also constructed, sometimes for good, for example, to strengthen communal identity, and sometimes less constructively. One small example concerns the way in which conflicted communities remember those killed by violent conflict. On a recent visit to the Shankill Road area of Belfast, I was reminded of a slogan I often see, um, which is this never forget slogan, and images elsewhere of those who've died. And of course, all of us understand that sentiment. We should never forget those that we've lost. But if those memories are used to perpetuate ongoing violence, they will in fact contribute to more death. What does it take for such a community to acknowledge the pain and suffering, not only of themselves, but of the other side too. And the future lives yet to be snatched by violence on both sides. The walls, I mean, you'll know this, David, uh, I, I'm, I'm struck by how they're still up, they're still tall. In fact, in some cases, they're taller than they were during the Troubles. Grandparents can pass on suspicion and negative stereotypes, and children quickly learn to mistrust the other side. As long as fear and hatred is passed on from generation to generation, sustainable peace is elusive. And actually another contributing fact to that is the continuation of segregated schools uh, where uniforms define you and also define your, uh, your community. One of the um, key tools of reconciliation is supporting communities in remembering their history through a shared rather than a divided lens. And this also includes telling her story, not just his story, because, of course, women are often written out of history, as are minorities. The sharing of history doesn't deny the distinctive and different histories that make up our past, but it does give a voice to competing histories. Seventh one, we're nearly there, is upholding processes of justice and accountability. Some form of accountability for crimes committed is essential for reconciliation and for a community to move forward. A public and punitive or retributive process like a national or international tribunal can support the reconciliation process by helping to rebuild a safer environment. For example, just practically locking up offenders. Uh, it can also help to reduce the likelihood of victims or their families seeking private revenge. And it can... Um, uh, also help to address offenders denying or continuing to perpetuate abusive behaviour. Punishing key individuals can also release the rest of their community from being held responsible. I'm trying to think of positives <laughs> here. Um, so challenging those broad brushstroke uh, negative stereotypes. For example, all Serbs did this. We actually have much to learn from traditional and indigenous mediation processes. An emphasis on restorative justice begins with the person and their community in assessing misconduct. It encourages accountability on the part of the offender, helping them to understand the consequences of their action and, where appropriate, seek to make amends or remorse or show remorse. The role of the wider community is vital in this process, aiming towards a situation in which offender and victim can either be slowly and safely reintegrated or can move on in their separate journey of reconciliation. And there's just some examples. This is one that we're involved uh, in in Bourganville, um, where the church has been training thousands of people as restorative pra uh, justice practitioners following its bitter civil war. They serve as village mediators, identifying and transforming minor conflicts that are, have arisen since the war ended, 
and preventing them, supposedly preventing them from festering. Uh, actually, a local name for this is one bell, based on a traditional Melanesian concept of reconciliation that means one belly. Again, a reminder of this uh, uh, meal concept, sharing a meal. In Sudan, uh, we also have uh, a mediation process uh, where community, community mediators are trained up. They host meetings in which all complaints and perspectives are voiced, very often with long and passionate speeches from opposing parties, um, which reminds us, and, and uh, Bishop Anthony was reminding us, that this can be a long process. We often kind of want to quickly jump to the, the conclusion, but that very process of being heard is really, really important in that. In, in that. Final um, uh, pattern is addressing wider injustices in society. So um, uh, looking at some of the cultural practices that inhibit reconciliation and peace. It might mean broadening, broadening the balance of power and giving a voice to those on the margins or in the minority. The church, um, our church is, is playing a key role in calling out injustice in some of the situations that we find ourselves in and in fact, one of our five marks of mission is this, to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, and to pursue peace and reconciliation. Again, we're not always very good at living up to that, uh, but that's the, that's the, the aim. Um, the Bible and indeed the Quran also, and I'm sure other scriptures are full of examples of God speaking through the mouths of his prophets, challenging widespread injustice and corruption in their own and others' community. The prophetic task of faith leaders is risky and thankless, but one that everyone uh, should aspire to. All too often we hear of church leaders who are compromised by their close relationship with the state. This is an appalling betrayal of trust and runs counter to uh, the reconciliation process. Faith leaders should never be so close to politicians that they cannot see their wrongs or stand up to them. Neither should they be so far away that they have no influence when they do see something wrong. Church leaders should be the voice, or, or faith leaders should be the voice of the voiceless, even though that is a risky um, place for them to be. This prophetic role can include commentary on specific policies, but often um, exposing aspects of our culture that exacerbate conflict, one of which is vengeance. Um, again, Bishop Anthony, w w when we have our question time, we can talk a little bit more to the pattern of vengeance in the community, an eye for an eye. Um, uh, Bishop Anthony told us yesterday about Gandhi saying, an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. I thought that was nice. Um, other embedded mindsets in our cultures include tribal and sectarian loyalty over the wider good, and even a benign ideology like that of tolerance. It's not enough to tolerate those that we don't like or understand. If we just have tolerance, it's a shallow form of reconciliation. In fact, it's not even reconciliation, really. It can easily um, spiral back into a place of conflict once again. Um, so I'm just going to end now uh, by telling you two programs that uh, we've uh, been putting into place at Lambeth, just in case you want to hear of a practical program. If I can find a picture. One I mentioned before is our Women on the Frontline program, um, and this is recognizing and strengthening women in what they do already. Community, this isn't, this isn't necessarily senior leaders, this is community leaders. Um, we've actually noticed that many of the wives of clergy, are cat in fact, all the wives of clergy in most of the situations we're dealing with, are catapulted into public leadership roles. And uh, we really want to uh, strengthen them in those roles and, and actually affirm them because they go unnoticed in most of the work that they do. The other um, group that we're working with is an initiative called the Reconciling Leaders Network. And that's about uh, mobilizing, uh, equipping emerging leaders right across different sectors. It might be in the civil service, in the armed forces, in um, teacher training colleges, in seminaries, uh, to understand the principles of transforming conflict and to apply that back into their workplace but also their communities and their homes. Uh, so if you want to find out more about that we can talk later. So just to conclude, um, speaking now again with uh, my Anglican hat on, um, as a worldwide church we, like many of our other uh, colleagues in the churches, take our initiative from God who we see as the ultimate reconciler and we follow the example of Jesus. 
We understand that every human being is made in the image of God, whether or not their actions live up to that claim. In fact, we think that nobody lives up to the claim uh, of being made in the image of God. So we see the face of God in those we encounter, and we recognize the action of God in and through others. Such an ideology has no room for personal triumphalism or superiority. Rather, it seeks a humility to recognize the faults in ourselves before highlighting those of others. Ultimately, reconciliation, we believe, is only possible in heaven, but the journey towards it is vital for the flourishing of our world. Brokenness in one part soon translates to a wider dis-ease. Or put another way, the well-being of one part is deeply connected to the well-being of, an, of another, of all, in fact. In fact, there's a lovely verse in the Quran as well um, that says to kill one life is as if you've killed all, and to save one life is as if you've saved all. So it's a similar principle coming out of the Quran. Thank you. Sarah, thanks very much. And uh, Bishop Anthony, welcome to the panel. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I thought we'd start um, just by, um, uh, Bishop Anthony, if you wouldn't mind just saying just a little bit about your own faith journey, background, experiences in South Sudan, just to give us a, um, a, 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 you know, some background into how you got into your present position uh, w w working with the Archbishop as, as, a, uh, as a help in this field. Uh, well, I, I was born in South Sudan, and for the first nine years of my life, we, we, my, my family moved to Uganda, and so I was there as a refugee. Uh, came back uh, to South Sudan when I was nine, um, went through college. Um, once again, war broke out. Uh, many of our people were forced out. Uh, I went out for studies again, and... Um, the third time, once again, many of our people have once again been forced out. So uh, people my age have been forced out of South Sudan at least three times. In, you know, so uh, personally, uh, I, was, I, was, I was born in a, in a Christian family. And so being brought up you know, in that atmosphere meant that I had to make a decision definitely to, 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 to become a, a, a believer personally. And so that background, you know, helped me to, 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 to always look at uh, things from a different perspective. Uh, after university, I went into uh, working for, again, among young people. Part of that was to help them because of the challenges that many of them have gone through. Uh, went and served now as when I became a bishop, I had a passion really wanting to help people come out of poverty because I saw that that, that was widespread across South Sudan. And I also realized that uh, poverty was contributing to continuous conflict, a cycle of violence and conflict in many parts of South Sudan. So that, that, that uh, is, is my background. Mm -hmm. Could you say a little bit about um, uh, the situation in South Sudan now? Um, well, South Sudan is the, the world's uh, newest country. Um, after many years of conflict, a uh, peace agreement was signed in 2005. Uh, one of the cardinal uh, parts of that agreement was that there was to be a referendum for the people of South Sudan to decide to become an, uh, to choose either to become an independent country or maintain unity with, with Sudan. So they chose, uh, when the referendum was held in January 2011, they chose to become a separate country. In fact, the outcome of that referendum was 98.8% chose to become a separate country. Uh, we all thought, well, this is it now. We now have peace. We have our own country. However, three years later, our people, once again, our leaders, especially our leaders, you know, fought over power, and the result is that, once again, South Sudan has, has you know, gone back to, to, to war for the last four years. The result of that is that uh, over two million people have been either displaced internally or been forced out of South Sudan to the neighboring country as countries as refugees. And another one or 0.2 or 0.5 million people again are facing starvation. 
So you would see that in one or the other, about you know, two th one, one third of the population is directly affected by the conflict, uh, really over, over the issue of power, struggle of our leaders over power. And the, the, the average, the, the ordinary person is, is suffering because of uh, what our leaders, the decisions that they have made, uh, which is really struggle over power. Mm -hmm. Can I ask another cycle? Yeah, please. I just wanted to ask you, Bishop Anthony, uh, to share a little bit about the cycle of revenge and retaliation, which is so prominent. Some of the cultures in South Sudan actually encourage revenge, uh, and I'm thinking particularly of one or two tribes where that is uh, so common that uh, whenever any person within your community or within your family either is killed or you have to pay back, uh, often it, will, it might even take a long time. They would not forget. They would do do what they can. If if they can find a person from the family of the killer, that's better. If they can't, then they will look for a person from the other clan. If not, then the tribe. Uh, and often they would go for a person who is either if the person was a chief, they will go for another chief or they will go for a more important person so that you can actually feel you know, the loss that you have, uh, the, the loss that, 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 that has happened as a result of the revenge killing. So that is such a common thing that uh, in our view it's also, it's, it's continues to uh, exacerbate the conflict because then the cycle of revenge continues to happen across many parts of this particular community. Now, uh, that's a, a, a very, a, a very a key thing that we see uh, in many of our communities in, in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a little bit about your transition to Lambeth Palace? Um, I mean, how how, um, uh, how difficult have you found it to be um, <laughs> at the headquarters of? Uh, yeah, global Anglicanism. Um, uh, uh, and I mean, what, what, what's your what's your impressions of of, um, of uh, adapting to this life? And what what kind of things does the headquarters of Global Anglicanism need to know? Well, I think the first thing is the weather. I, <laughs> <laughs> I remember the night they arrived, and they were tired and freezing cold. Uh, most parts of South Sudan, temperatures like, go from 20 to 30 or 40 degrees. Uh, uh, that's Celsius. I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit. Um, and, and then coming to London, that was one of the, the, the big changes for us. But uh, I, I, I was, uh, as a diocesan bishop, I was already involved in the global Anglican affairs, used to participate in a number of meetings. Um, it's definitely different from being a bishop to now coming to work at Lambeth Palace. Um, but I have a passion for the, the, the unity of, of the communion, uh, realizing that there are differences within the Anglican communion, but all the difference that we have, there is a way we can find, a way we can agree on the differences. We, we, it's like a family, within a family, you may not agree on every aspect of, of what you have within that family, but I believe in, in unity, in diversity. I think that's so crucial, so important. Uh, it does not mean that you compromise your own position, but it actually means that whatever issues you face, whatever differences you face, you work through these this, this issues. And so I, that's, in my view, very, very important. Great. If I could maybe just pose to both of you, I mean, it's a linked question a little bit. I mean, um, um, some people might say that um, w w one of the problems that a, a global Anglican communion w w would have to deal with is it, its own legacy of um, uh, how it came to be a global communion. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think of Ireland, for example, where the, uh, you know, the Church of England, Stroke Church of Ireland was the established church, which had 90% of the resources and less than 10% of the population. And um, the legacy of that still, and I imagine there are similar stories in other parts of the world. So I was kind of wondering how you, uh, I mean, if you encountered the legacies of that and, and how you think about that in terms of um, how the, the communion can be the kind of reconciling force? I mean, how much attention needs to be paid to that history 
Uh, I mean, I, I was struck, uh, uh, for example, when you talked about memory, that that neither amnesia nor a paralyzing memory. But I, I wonder if this applies a little bit to the church itself, or how how you, how you think about that. I mean, I'd be interested in both of your views on that, really. Yeah. Can you go fast enough? Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just going to give a very practical example. Um, uh, we have to be, uh, obviously, and we are extraordinarily aware of the colonial um, uh, presence, the colonial past, uh, the ongoing potential for a colonial structure in a church that has a hierarchy, um, and the Anglican Church does have a hierarchy. Um, one of the, the principles in terms of our reconciliation uh, interventions, and it, it's definitely the case in South Sudan and, in fact, in every country we work in, is that we work only through in-country. Um, uh, so we don't fly in and impose outsiders in sorting out an in-country uh, challenge. We work through the church on the ground and we work ecumenically, therefore, with other churches in that country, but we have an in-country approach. Um, so the way in which we can support, if you like, is um, by standing alongside, if we need to stand alongside, or by being an advocate at the international level, if that helps. But it's all in uh, 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 led from and out of requests from in-country. Right. But Anthony, you might like to add well, to that. Well, maybe, maybe to add that the, 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 the Anglican Communion, the way it is structured, in every province, the 39 provinces within the communion are, are all autonomous, and they are they are they are led locally. Uh, every every primate, of every archbishop in each of these 39 provinces, you know, lead his, his group of bishops, uh, you know, uh, you know, in an autonomous way. But we still have you know similar structure. There are things that, of course. You know, unite us. Uh, one of them, of course, of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, regardless of wherever you are, you even in a different language, you would follow uh, that, that particular prayer. But but there is that um, uh, local way in which you you contextualize. You know, the 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 the, the, the Anglican faith. Uh, but I think the other the other important thing to say is that because the communion the Anglican communion is in 165 countries we we are we are almost in most parts of the world uh, but it's not only uh, are we in most parts of the world but we we are in urban centers in rural set, setting we are everywhere not only the Anglican communion but all churches and other faith organizations and so that actually is an is, a, is an, an excellent way in which messages of peace and reconciliation can go across various various parts of the world, you know, rural and urban, perhaps even better than government structures because yeah. of the fact that you know we meet people come 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 to our places of worship every Sunday or every Friday or every Saturday, and so that is an, an something that we need to, to you know take advantage of even as we pass messages of peace across across the globe. Mm. I can ask just maybe one final question and then just open it out. Um, um, it, it's a while since I've read um, uh, uh, Bishop Justin's vision of reconciliation, but my fading memories of it were that um, it was almost a kind of two-step process. One was uh, reconciliation within the church and its various constituencies, um, but all, uh, and then also reconciliation, you know, uh, uh, with other religious traditions or. or, or uh, and um, I suppose the question I might have is that, um, given that this is such an important part of his um, uh, 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 ministry as, uh, as Archbishop of Canterbury, um, how would you evaluate, even in that period of time, relatively short period of time that he's been in that position, um, uh, has, uh, has this had a, a substantial impact within the church? Uh, has his um, desire to um, um, uh, promote this as a particular part of his uh, ministry, has that had an impact on other churches, on international organizations? And I'd love just to hear a little bit about how you've seen that, uh, the impact, influence of that, and, and what your hopes might be for it, maybe in the, in the decade to come. Wow. Okay. Sorry, yes. <laughs> How long do we have? Um, 
Uh, I've only been there just over a year, uh, so so I can't claim any um, huge knowledge of before that time. But one of the things uh, I would say that has happened since Archbishop Justin came in is that we have begun um, to have a very much closer relationship with NGOs, with governments, with the UN, um, and with other churches around reconciliation. So we now, for example, work uh, weekly with the Vatican, uh, with the Presbyterians in South Sudan, um, with quite a lot of the other churches, depending on which country context. Uh, we work with our own British government every week. We're meeting around different conflict situations. They're coming to us, actually, for advice, which I, I think is extraordinary. That hasn't happened before. Um, and we also uh, brief uh, peacekeeping forces before they go out to uh, countries like South Sudan. Um, they will come in and we will uh, introduce them to people from in-country, usually uh, clergy who happen to be over in the UK at the time. Uh, but in, in almost every case, that is the first time those UK task forces or, US, uh, or UN task forces have actually met people from the country they're going to. So um, just a classic example. Uh, can you imagine the first time we did this, uh, it was a UN peacekeeping force going out to South Sudan. They'd never met any South Sudanese. They'd had all sorts of uh, practice for going out to South Sudan where they'd got actors to come in and pretend to be South Sudanese in the <laughs> forest in uh, uh, just outside London. And um, they had no preparation at all for the culture, the faith. They didn't know, for example, that most South Sudanese are Christian. They just thought, you know, they didn't, hadn't really thought about a religious identity. Um, there was so much that they learned in just a couple of hours with clergy uh, from South Sudan, and they said it was the most informative briefing they'd ever seen, which is why we now do more of them. But how simple was that from, from, our, from our end? So I think, you know, to answer your question, one of the ways in which I've seen a change is that there is a much um, greater awareness that the church has a role to play in reconciliation. Um, and that the church has this extraordinary reach that goes out into all the grassroots communities. So we've got this, you know, one of the good things of a hierarchy, I suppose, is that you can get a message to a country through the primate, and it will go straight down through the bishops, through the clergy, and out into all the communities. That's quite a powerful network. And then, of course, in terms of briefings, that can come back the other way. We can have really helpful lines of communication. And then our role is to protect uh, communities from being in instrumentalized by that process. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, thank you. Well, maybe to us to add that the 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 fact that the archbishop also has access to some of the leaders may would also mean yeah. that he can he can pass on messages that perhaps will not reach these leaders when he does mm -hmm. uh, you know visit some of these countries uh, and also in one particular case you know, his visit to this particular country enabled the local bishop to meet the local governor who, because they belong to different faiths, was initially reluctant. Mm -hmm. and, but he was able to bring that kind of uh, connection between these two, two leaders. And hopefully, after he, le after he left, there will be that continuous, you know, interaction between this particular leader and, and the local governor in that particular area. So these are some of the things that you, you know, he has been able to, to do in a practical way. I think there's also huge power at, at that top level mm. of uh, joint partnerships in, mm. in get intervening in conflict. So for example, Archbishop Justin and uh, Pope Francis being able to collectively speak into a situation is a very powerful double act in countries like mm -hmm. DRC, Burundi, South Sudan, um, where mm -hmm. there is a strong Catholic and uh, Protestant presence. Yeah. Great, thanks. Great, well look, um, we've now got some time to open things up. Um, so, uh, we, have we got someone with a microphone? We've got two microphones. So um, uh, please, uh, when you ask a question, uh, just uh, say uh, your name and um, uh, where you're from. And, um, uh, and remember, questions are uh, short statements with question marks at the end. Um, so, um, uh, uh, so I'll try and hold you to that. So any, any questions? Um, So we'll start here, and we'll get to you in a second. Um, hi, my, my name is Denise Schlickbrand. I'm a first year here at the Divinity School. 
Um, I had a question for the bishop. Um, I believe you mentioned, um, for example, some of the tribes that you worked with had traditions of re revenge, um, which would obviously start that cycle of revenge upon one after another. Uh, what were some specific steps you took with those tribes to try to persuade them, at, at the very least, to not kill more people? The, the church often you know, speaks to such situations. Um, for, for those who first follow the Christian Bible, the teachings are done from the, from the Bible, from the Word of God. But also, often sitting together and explaining that you know, continuous uh, vengeance or revenge actually will perpetrate more killings. And, and, and that, that really is, is what, what, what is, you know, the community and the churches spend a lot of time trying to help people. And bringing people together is, is important. Uh, it's, it's a cultural thing ingrained in the culture, and so it takes time. It's a, it will take time. Uh, but we've seen a lot of changes. My own, my own community, we have 64 tribes in South Sudan. My own community also many years ago used to, used to do that. Uh, but I think we've seen a lot of change uh, in, in our own community uh, as a result of uh, teaching, as a result of the fact that uh, you know, the systems are put in place. And the government sometimes also comes in uh, so that uh, they, it, it enforces you know, uh, through its own structures. But as a church, we, we do a lot of teaching and uh, help people to have an understanding. And quoting from the scripture, for those of course who believe scripture, but to believe the Bible. Yeah, so. um, yeah. Can you wait for the microphone? Thanks, yeah. Thanks, yeah. I have two questions. First of all, on revenge, what is the role that the sexes play? Is it men against men, men against women? Are women involved in the violence? Um, just, you know, what is the role? And a reconciliation, you indicated that your government, the British government, was coming to your church to re reconcile. Well, in the U.S., our Congress has a problem. Do you think our, the church here can do something? <laughs> okay, do you want to answer the women and the men? Yeah. Um, linked to the issue of revenge, there is also the issue of uh, negative ethnicity, or otherwise known as tribalism. You find that, again, that's another thing that is ingrained in some of the cultures. Uh, and when it comes to that, you find that uh, the community is involved, both men and women. But when it comes to issues of peace, the women play you know, a, a problem more important a better role in encouraging peace and reconciliation than the men. Uh, because often women would say, we are the ones who, who suffer more if people are killed. You know, the men are go to fight and leave us as widows and leave us orphans to take care of. And so they are more understanding when it comes to issues of uh, peace and reconciliation. But in terms of the revenge, yes, it's, 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 uh, uh, if it's a communal, community, uh, tribal thing, it's, it affects everybody. But when it comes to pursuing peace, the women are better in pursuing process of peace. Um, thanks for the question. <laughs> I'd love to uh, answer that fully, but I'm not sure how censored I have to be, so I'm going to be quite careful. Um, firstly, I would say the church has to have a prophetic voice. Um, and part of that prophetic voice means calling out um, corruption or uh, misuse of power or uh, estrangement of the other or pushing people to the margins or stopping um, kindness to those who need compassion. Uh, as church, we have a responsibility to call that out, even though we may not be popular in doing that. Um, I also would say, coming from a conservative evangelical um, church myself, in terms of my upbringing, that sometimes we, the church, can be the worst culprit at uh, drawing lines between us and them, using this binary language. Well, you know, uh, you know even, even down to the kind of Christian you have to be in order to be a Christian, you know, that kind of language. Um, so the church can, can be very unhelpful 
uh, but it also can be extraordinarily powerful if it's willing to have this prophetic voice and live up, I would live out that call that says, love the stranger, care for the widow, look after the homeless and the hungry. Um, you really put those who are on the margins of society back into the center of the church's attention. And I think in doing that, it actually exposes some of the difficulties that you're facing uh, here. We're facing too, to be frank, um, in, uh, in terms of government. Is that sensitive enough? <laughs> Diplomatic enough. Uh, maybe just a follow on from that though. Do, do you ever feel in these um, uh, encounters with government that you're being played in some way or that you're. Um, 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 uh, uh, so, ha um, so, how does that work? I mean, did, uh, to get influence uh, and access, is there some compromise has to take place? Or I know you mentioned this kind of prophetic voice, but I can just see the settings of. Uh, of how this can uh, this could work. Um, so, uh, yeah. so the first um, when I was working uh, here in the uh, UN context, I actually did go to a State Department it was under Obama's uh, um, regime, but went to a, a, a very substantial conference for faith leaders hosted by the State Department, where they wanted to basically get all the faith leaders to help them uh, come up with policies that would push out extremism. Now, at that conference, we all felt highly instrumentalized. And what happened was nobody wanted to work, uh, really, a few people who did, um, but nobody really wanted to engage. Uh, we've had a similar program in the UK, um, uh, which is around, um, uh, called MAMA, actually, but it's around um, calling out extremism. When we notice extremism in the children in our communities, uh, mothers and teachers are, are encouraged to, uh, to name that, it, supposedly to protect the child in that situation who is vulnerable to extremism. But of course, again, that um, was hugely unpopular because it was effectively encouraging spying in the community. Um, and uh, so, so I'm trying to remember the question now. Yeah, it's just, uh, it, it is a kind of, yeah, yeah, what I've found with the British government is actually, um, I'm amazed how little they understand, and the same here actually with your government, how little they understand about the mindset of people of faith. Um, and therefore, what we're finding is they genuinely want to know uh, more about what it is to be a community of faith. So, so there, is, there is actually much more mutual um, engagement. And I would say it's quite a health, certainly with the British government at the moment, quite a healthy engagement. And they particularly want to know where they went disastrously wrong with our Muslim communities. Um, and they're doing that not by asking other people, but by going to the Muslim communities and saying, can you help us change? How can we be better in this engagement? So. Right. Thank you. There was someone at the back, and then, yeah. Um. Thank you so much for this uh, wonderful panel and presentation. My question, I guess, to Dr. Snyder. Um, you talked about the program, but, like, you know, getting together the Palestinian and Israelis, uh, you know, religious leaders or young people. So I'm wondering about the impact <coughs> on the conflict when you get those people. I understand that they understand each other and they hear the stories, but like when each one of them go to his zone and the media keep feeding, you know, um, and wash brains, you know, over, brainwash, I mean, the people over there, there. I'm from the Middle East, from Syria, and I understand like what does the media do? Uh, so question mark for this question. The second question to you, do you see a role for religion to help in reconciliation where the uh, re religious leaders support the leaders and they have the same position as the leaders. I'm talking about the dictators, uh, for example, in Syria and Egypt, or the religious leaders who, su who support the policy in Saudi Arabia and Iran, for example, and keep stimulate, stimulating and mobilizing the people uh, you know, in the same way they see the words from religious perspective that those are our enemy because they are different than us. About like Sunni Shia and, you know, here I'm talking, and about supporting the dictators in Syria and Egypt examples. Question mark, thank you. Just <laughs> little questions, hey. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that um, just very generally to start at the end and go back, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me when I'm working in the Middle East is that, of course, 
uh, religion and politics and every aspect of life are totally fused. There's not this neat separation of, you know, there's a religious leader over there and there's a political, there's a politician over here. The, there's an enormous overlap. Of course, people have their own specialities, um, but politicians are religious leaders and religious leaders are political leaders and, and there is a lot of overlap. Uh, so we had a, a workshop, uh, was it? I was going to say yesterday, was it this morning, um, where we were looking at some of, the, um, uh, some of the parameters of what here we understand as church-state separation. Um, how close is too close between religious leaders and politicians? Um, and how far is too far? And is there some kind of happy medium? What is the role of religious leaders as different to politicians? But again, I think it goes back a little bit to the question before where religious leaders have a very distinct task, um, and that is to be a voice for their communities, um, and hopefully to be a voice for more than their own communities, a voice for a moral order that is able to call out immorality in those political leaders. Um, and that is really hard to do, especially in many of the country contexts that we're dealing with, where there are tribal affiliations. So you may be a, as we have actually with our own archbishop in uh, South Sudan, happens to be the same tribe as the president of South Sudan. That's challenging, that's difficult uh, in that kind of context because you've got divided loyalties suddenly. You know, how prophetic can you be or how brave can you be in calling out um, a, a politician in that situation? Um, so I think that, that there is a role for religious leaders to play in reconciliation. Um, I think the role that religious leaders can play is very different to the role that politicians play, and I think it's rightly different. Um, I also think that uh, the religious leaders have an ability, they're not always very good at it, but have an ability to journey with their communities in that long, long, long and cyclical road of reconciliation in a holistic way. So they are looking out for the spiritual and emotional and mental health as well as the physical needs of their communities. Um, and again, that's different to the structures of a peace negotiation that the politicians will put together. In terms of, of actual examples of what happens when people go home from some of these, these are just uh, examples of some of the residential programs that we've run. Um, it is actually profound how um, much they do when they go back home. In fact, my WhatsApp is constantly pinging all the time with different people from all around the world sending more photographs of things that they're doing. Just one example from Rafat, as I put a picture of him up there, uh, he um, realized that in uh, West Bank, the scout movement was separate for Christian and Muslim children. And he felt that one place he could start, because he can't go across the border, was by bringing together uh, Christian and Muslim children and uh, forming a joint scout movement. And he started that in his own hometown and uh, it then got the notice of the government, and then that was a trial that's now expanded much, much further into Palestine. And forming those relationships in the community across Christian Muslim lines has been a really effective way of then being able to, they actually now do run cross-border programs with the scouts into uh, Israel. They meet in Tel Aviv with the Jewish, uh, the Israeli scout movements. Um, so he's done all of that over the course of the last couple of years since he had a one-week experience of meeting the Israelis. Um, one other example, just to give a practical example, Ali Tarek is a, uh, a Pakistani madrasa-educated Muslim who came on our program. When he went back, his view of Christians uh, was, you know, as many in the Middle East, was of Westerners. You know, when, when we hear about Christianity, we're talking about the West. Um, and he uh, was profoundly moved by the realization that there were Pakistani Christians. He just hadn't really ever met any uh, in his own country. Um, and he, he, did, he, as he said in his own words, they speak, like, they speak my language, they dress like I dress, they eat my food, and they're Christians. You know, that, that, how, can I, how can I have this neat stereotype of Christians now when they're, when they're people like me? So what he's done is um, very bravely, I would say, uh, go to the Church of Pakistan and um, begin this uh, youth movement uh, with the church where he's bringing madrasa-educated young people and uh, Christian young Pakistanis into the same spaces. And that program is now happening in different parts of Pakistan, including in Peshawar, where it's having quite a big effect. So, I mean, they're just two little examples, but there are hundreds and hundreds of examples. And I think, 
you know, reconciliation always has to start with, with people, individuals. We can talk about big strategies, and we need big strategies, but it's the people on the ground who, who actually make the difference. So. Um, so one here, one here, and one at the back, yeah, so. Hi, thank you. Uh, Charles Leland, an alumnus of uh, the Divinity School. Um, the two million uh, South Sudanese refugees was mentioned. And I was wondering if uh, both of you could comment on reconciliation in the context of refugees or 65 million displaced persons. How do you reconcile when they're displaced? Ah, yeah. Well, we're, we're doing that, so we can talk about that. <laughs> doing a lot of that. It's, it's, it's hard, it's difficult um, visiting the the people from the place where I was bishop, 95% of them having been displaced and visiting them was hard even for me. Um, but we, we try to give them hope. Um, and I think uh, the, f the, f the fact that many, some of them have, uh, believe in a God help, makes a lot of difference. Faith in them makes a lot of difference. Uh, Arriving there, the Archbishop Justin himself visited, and when the Archbishop visited, he he went to encourage them, but he also found encouragement because these are people, in spite of their suffering, you could see that at least there was some some joy, and they felt someone has come to hear hear to to, to hear the, you know, their concerns. Um, so, yes, for the for those who have believers in in in, in the faith, that's they find encouragement from that and that's what sustains, sustains them, uh, giving them the uh, different uh, you know, p perspective to life. Otherwise, the ordinary person would have said, well, I, I want to revenge, I don't want to forgive, but I, when, you, when, I, when you meet some of them, uh, you find that they find a lot of encouragement. It's also worth saying that the faith leaders, of course, are in the camps with their people. They're not, they're not without their own faith leaders. So there is, a, in many ways, uh, in the camps, uh, everything happens just as it did at home. Um, you're just displaced. You're not at home. Uh, but the systems of being able to um, work with different communities, and there are huge factions within these refugee camps, uh, so there is an enormous amount of reconciliation work that's going on. Um, uh, that still that still continues in in a similar way to the way it would outside, uh, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, um, here and then we'll just go to the back row for the, the two to back there. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, we're dealing now with a lot of hundreds of children and families uh, right here um, in the United States fearing deportation. And what we see is uh, many of children and families would like to a, see uh, faith leaders um, use that prophetic voice uh, that we're talking about, but it's lacking. And on another side as well, when they don't see that prophetic voice, you know, especially from those who are influential, faith leaders who, who have influence. They also would expect from uh, their own um, church where they would find solace, where they would find healing. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, we see faith communities that have become so much um, involved in fundraising rather than the being the prophetic voice. Um, being more political <laughs> rather than really um, giving the gospel, you know, and, and, and helping others. How can we, knowing that, how can that prophetic voice be really resurrected? Because we need it. Because those who have the, I mean, actually, we have some churches who are using the prophetic voice, but they are losing influence and those that have the influence are not using the prophetic voice. How, what do we do? Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's not a very, uh, that's a, a very difficult question. 
speaking from my the context that I'm familiar with, of course, is Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. The it's important for the religious leaders to be reminded of their call, their calling, which is to speak on behalf of the voiceless. That that's that is important. I think the other thing again is what we had talked about earlier on, which was that the the importance of church leaders ensuring or religious leaders ensuring that they they maintain that, that critical distance so that they are not part and parcel of this, the systems, the government systems that are there. In fact, I think David Guitari, whose picture was shown here, his advice to religious leaders was that the relationship between religious leaders and government should be like the similar to the relationship between human being and fire. When you are too close, it is too hot. When you are too far, it is too cold. And I think that is a very powerful image of what should happen, really. Because if, if you are too far, you, you, you are quiet and you leave your, your flock effectively, you know, uh, you don't speak on their behalf, then really you're not undertaking your prophetic role. Now, there's the other extreme where people also believe prophetic role means criticizing the government all the time. No, prophetic role means speaking on behalf of the voiceless. Of course, when the government does a good thing, praise the government. When it does something that is not appropriate, speak it without fear or, or, or favor. Um, I mean, I, I am passionate uh, that the church is not using its prophetic voice enough. And uh, I think what I see uh, is that when the church is at its most comfortable, um, and in the West, we have to be honest, I'm sitting next to my friend here, uh, we have a comfortable church on the whole, um, many uncomfortable people within it, but they are a comfortable church. Uh, they sit back on their laurels, we sit back on our laurels, um, and we don't speak out uh, with that prophetic voice and you know these children they, they've really caught my heart i've been watching cnn since i got over here and and you know, it's obviously been uh, you know a lot of pictures and even the adverts that are coming on let alone the news um but uh, this is something where the church does need to speak up the one thing i would say uh, practically is that um for the church to be heard it has to speak out in a balanced way um, not always. There are times like the suffragettes where you just have to absolutely go for it and, uh, you know, you nail yourself to the cross doing so. And there are times when that's what's needed. Um, but there are other times when there is a balance that's needed in order to be heard. Um, and I think that's a wisdom that comes from, uh, it's not just a prophetic voice, it's a wise prophetic voice that knows the difference. So a couple of questions at the back, and then yeah. Sorry. Thank you so <laughs> much. I now know why I got so cold, but I came. Um, I have a prophetic voice that can be very critical and can get you fired or excommunicated, but I'm realizing now I should work on reconciliation a bit. Uh, I was delighted with Cambridge at, at Martin Luther King Day. Uh, did a wonderful program, including the new mayor, uh, at an Episcopal church. But as I was leaving, I saw a comment on a bulletin board that kind of said, Jesus died for all, but more so for some of us. And that, <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but I think we need to look at the scriptures, uh, because the the tribalism is there, the revenge is there, and more people who are in Washington D.C. are reading that part of scripture. So we need to read carefully, um, but we also need to look at our other pieces, like the the lectionary, what's in there and what's not in there at the Book of Common Prayer or whatever we use, how do we begin to, to really look at what helps us but may be harmful to other people? Thank you. Hmm. Do you want an answer to that? <laughs> I think that's more of a comment, thank you. <laughs> uh, and I, maybe to add that, yes, I agree, you know, scripture should, uh, you know, 
for those who follow Christian well, Christian who follow scripture, you should follow it and not 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 follow it selectively. I think I would agree. Yeah. So a question at there and then turning. Uh, first, I wanted to say thank you for this uh, lovely presentation this evening. Um, I am Wendell. I am a lawyer um, from Oxford University, and I'm a multidisciplinary researcher, and I've been investigating the uh, violence terrorism causation and violence terrorism cessation, and I go back to 10,000 BCE in my investigation. And one part of my research has been investigating the role of the Bible in giving rise to violence against women. In particular, raping with impunity, the incest, and the hashtag Me Too movement events, and including what happened this past week in Dorchester in England with the, uh, the charity event. And my question is, do you envision a role for the religious leaders to come together and talk to the men and to the women about the violence against women? Do you want to take I'll take this one. Uh, yes. <laughs> is that enough of an answer? I mean, of course. You know, what more is there to say? Uh, it's a massive, massive um, uh, area of concern for, uh, you know, particularly in the situations where we're working, uh, in our home situations, uh, we need to, this is another example of a prophetic voice on behalf of the voiceless and those who are most vulnerable. Um, and the Bible is absolutely clear, and most of our scriptures are absolutely clear about the need to protect um, and not to violate one another. And uh, women fall into that vulnerable category far too often. So yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. My name is Terry Tempest Williams, and I'm writer in residence here at the Divinity School. You talked about a collective reimagining of the future and how arts can play a role in this. Could you elaborate, both of you, and perhaps share some examples? Yeah, OK. Um, gosh, there are so many ways in which the arts play a critical part in um, so one of the one of the tools really in terms of memory and history uh, is that we very often are stuck in a, a rut about the history we tell. You know, the, the tr it all went wrong when, or the troubles began when, or our community um, have experienced this uh, this history, and and you go back to a certain time. And so, just one of the tools we use is changing the starting point of your history. Um, and uh, one of the ways in which we do that is breaking down history into nuggets um, uh, that can be uh, either um, illustrated or acted. So they become like acts in a play. And then you look at uh, putting a, a pre-act in or a postscript in, or you even look at moving around some of those um, acts in the play. And it has a very profound impact, actually, on the way in which you then tell your retell your history. And, and so what we do is we usually get uh, the um, different groups in a community to come together uh, after a lot of pre-work that's happened, but they come together to share their um, uh, account, their telling of their history, having rearranged a little bit the history from the way they usually tell it. Um, and the other communities sit around and they watch that history. They engage in it. Um, they can ask questions of the actors. They can ask about what the gaps that they see in the history. So there's a kind of dialogue that opens up. Um, and then that uh, part of the community sit down and the other community uh, share their acting out or their drawings, however they've decided to do it. Sometimes it's murals on the sides of walls. Um, they talk through the, re, uh, the retelling of their own history. And then um, jointly, they begin to... Um, uh, write the play that they would like to write about the collective history uh, for that community. These are people that live in a shared space, like a neighborhood, for example. So drama, um, the arts, uh, song, uh, and music, huge part of the work we're doing in Pakistan is through music, uh, actually, um, which is interesting, because music is not universally popular or even... Um, allowed in some of the Muslim contexts in which we're working. But young people uh, love the fact that they're able to find a space where they can um, bring some of the music they're all listening to 
um, and look at the words of the music or look at the, the, the uh, write their own words to different music. So, I mean, there's countless, countless ways in which we're working with the arts. Just one more thing I would say, um, a very uh, wonderful um, uh, thing is uh, getting people to draw faces going back to the face. So when you sit in front of somebody, even if you're not very good at art, and you draw their face, and you're looking at their face, um, that is an act of hospitality, really. It's like a gift that you give uh, one another. So it's just a few. Hi, uh, my name is Farouk Martins. I'm the chief consultant for RSA Enterprises. For, for what? RSA Enterprises. Oh, yeah. We are more involved in public health than religion, you know. But some of the concern I have, which I'm sure some people also, is that even before we get to reconciliation and peace, there is a special role for mediators, neutral mediators. Mm -hmm. uh, Somebody like Senator Michel in Ireland, uh, the role played in Sudan, dividing Sudan into north and south, but not prepared or caught unawares of what was going to happen in South Sudan, the role of mediator or lack of it in Rwanda. And when I say mediator, I'm talking about the neutral ones now. Or what's going on in Myanmar right now, where the Rohingya people are being driven out? Then come back to the Middle East. Who is the neutral mediator today? I mean, are we concerned that we are losing the neutrality that is the most or the real essence that leads us to reconciliation and to peace? Because with that mediator, neutral one, which has actually been very well played by the Bishop of uh, Canterbury, you know, by the Pope, and sometimes even by organizations like Oxfam. Are you guys concerned? Um, just one comment on the role of the mediator, uh, because it's interesting, you, you talk about a neutral mediator, and, um, and I'm wondering, you know, at a national level, is there such a thing as a neutral mediator? Uh, in, in the work we do, mediators are individual people who are gifted, uh, qualified, personality-wise. It's not, you don't, you are trained to be a mediator, but I, I would say you, you can't become a mediator um, it, unless you have a certain set of qualities as a person. Some people are just not, not mediators, and that's okay. You know, they have other, other, other strengths. But the role of the individual mediator is absolutely critical in any reconciliation process. Um, and we have thousands of mediators that are out there working right across the Middle East and right across sub-Saharan Africa um, in individual communities. Uh, and they're doing this kind of shoulder to shoulder. They're the kind of mediator that can say, I, I hear you on this side, and I hear you on this side, um, and I'm going to faithfully try and uh, represent each of you, because you can't talk to each other by going this invisible um, going in between the two communities until you identify ways that they could actually come, come into the same space. So we do have thousands and thousands of mediators out there. But is that... Is that, I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, maybe to say that, and in many parts of Africa, the, 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 the church often tends to play such a role, particularly where there are family issues. You would find that you know, many of the people, they would know who within the community is gifted in trying to bring, you know, bring together families that are having issues. So yes, that's the mediator role. But I think it's, it's, there are a number of people who would be able to do that. I think the neutrality is important. Kofi Annan played that important role in Kenya, the post-election violence, and he, he did a, a, an excellent job doing that. In, su in such a case, he was, he was the best because he was a Kenyan, but he was African and come, came in with a lot of credibility. Uh, so yeah, there are a number of people there. But I think apart from that, the issue that we actually have is in many parts of Africa, you have 
leaders who do not have a vision for their own countries. So we need to find a way of how can we help the people to have to have vision for their own country. You, you mentioned South Sudan. This is really, you know, perhaps the, the lack of leader, the lack of vision for, for, for from, from some of the leaders is, 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 is what really contributed to, to that. So in such a case, you know, even if you had an excellent mediator, it, it wouldn't be much that you, you, you could do. Um, you know. I was just going to say, there is actually a new um, high-level uh, mediation uh, group at the UN, uh, senior leaders who have been brought together by uh, Gutierrez, the uh, Secretary General, and Archbishop Justin is in fact the only faith leader who's on that uh, panel of high-level mediators. But it uh, be interesting to watch that group because they are very prominent people um, and to see if more faith leaders are brought into that group as well. Justin is, uh, Archbishop Justin is very concerned to, to um, represent f different faith communities, seeing as he's currently the only faith leader on that mediation board, but uh, he would love it if he was joined by others. If I could maybe just to add something to, um, uh, um, you know, I, I think one thing your question was getting at was, you know, on a, a more macro level mm -hmm. in these kind of international disputes, um, is it possible for complete neutrality, especially mm -hmm. when national interests are at stake? And I think what I would say to that is that it's extremely difficult. Um, you did mention um, uh, Senator Mitchell and the Irish uh, mediation. Um, two or three things about that. Well, one, I think it was it was perceived by the two communities in in, in the north that um, um, that the American government was relatively neutral in this dispute. Um, 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 and secondly, Mitchell was an extraordinary emissary by any standards, just the patience, the time, the trust, the honesty, the transparency, the decency, um, eventually made an impact. It wasn't quick, it was, uh, and at the end of the day, it nearly didn't come off. I mean, you know, it was within 48 hours of falling apart um, and has, uh, you know, at various times subsequent to that, gotten into real difficulties, including right now. Um, so it's not, there's nothing about this that's easy. Um, uh, but I, I think in mediation, if there's perceived uh, interest groups manipulating a problem, you've got almost no chance of a successful mediation, I think. Um, um, so for it to work, I think you need so many of these components, and this more macro level, you know, as opposed to, you know, on the ground and in smaller communities, where I think you're absolutely right, all kinds of useful things can be done by individuals on the ground. But at that state level and bigger level, I think it's an extraordinarily difficult thing to bring off, mm -hmm. um, and has to have some of those components uh, as part of it, uh, especially the component, I think, where there's no very perceived self-interest at stake, mm -hmm. which made it difficult either for a British politician or a Republic of Ireland politician or even a European Union politician to uh, perform that role. It was easier in that case for it to be someone from, uh, in this case, the United States and a particular kind of person. Um, any other? We're getting near the end. Um, uh, question at the back. And one right down here. Uh, um, yeah, thank you. Just following on from what the dean just said, um, some of these uh, situations are so complex. I'm wondering if the Church of England as an institution has any particular rules of engagement or criteria around which you evaluate opportunities to get involved. Uh, conceivably, there are so many, some could be individuals, uh, but they are fraught with uh, difficulty on many sides. And I don't know the Irish uh, situation as well, but I can assume that, for example, the Church of England might not be seen as a, a good party to be mediating that. <laughs> So what, uh, as you go into some other areas, particularly in an interfaith context in Africa with Christians and Muslims, 
what, what criteria, how does the institution approach the decision to get involved? I suppose I have to answer that because I have to make those decisions um, often. But, uh, you know, the, the requests for reconciliation support are relentless and constant. Uh, and they come in from every part of the uh, communion. Um, and they're not just coming in from situations of violent conflict, they're uh, coming in from situations of uh, other kinds of conflict. It might be domestic abuse, um, but it might also be internal friction or division over um, differences of opinion. So every kind of conflict. Uh, I, um, I suppose we end up evaluating on the basis of being a small team, uh, where can the Anglican Church um, make most difference on the ground. And that very often is about uh, the quality of our relationships there with the other church communities on the ground um, and very much with the other faith communities on the ground. If we feel that our um, engagement through the in-country church that's present uh, is a tipping point, can make a tipping point difference, then that shoots up to the top of our priority list. Um, if we feel that, in fact, our engagement will be uh, one of many um, engagements uh, that's not going to have a kind of tipping point difference, then we tend to let others uh, continue the really good work that they're doing. So that's And South Sudan was a good example where the, the Vatican came to us and said, you know, we could, we have a window of opportunity potentially to do something very, uh, uh, very, very, um, particular here in terms of a joint intervention and we went to the Presbyterian Church so those are the three biggest faith communities present in South Sudan um, and therefore we're really able to have quite a tipping point difference uh, and we, we've been doing a lot of work and there's a lot going on under the ground there um, is that enough of a we happen to be doing quite a lot in the Great Lakes region DRC Burundi and uh, many of those countries too uh, Climate yeah. change uh, is predicted and perhaps already has affected the vulnerable most acutely in obviously areas where you're working. Uh, and of course, m in many cases, those are people who have had the least to do with causing it. And I wonder very specifically how you speak to that prophetically from a Christian Western perspective, the, the causers of it, should we say out loud, and how it factors into your work. Yeah. Do you want to? Well, go for the causes, then I'll give an example of what we did. Do you want to? OK. Um, you know, it's, it, it's interesting. The church has been so reticent, hasn't it, to engage uh, with the environmental uh, situation. Sometimes I think that's because of uh, a theology that suggests that really this world will, will uh, be no longer, and we've got another world to look forward to, so why would we worry too much about this world? Um, that, that's all you know, gone, I would say now. I still meet pockets of that kind of theology, but much less. Uh, very specifically in the Anglican Church, we have a team dedicated to um, uh, advocacy on the environmental um, uh, agenda with government. Uh, we have a team here in America, actually, uh, through the Episcopal Church. Uh, we have a UN team that's present in, the, uh, uh, in New York, uh, specifically uh, um, bringing environmental experts to speak into the policies that are going, in, um, uh, going through Parliament. So we would often speak in Westminster to the environmental policies uh, as they come through. But we could do a lot more. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm not going to talk on the cause, but I'm perhaps give two examples of some of the things that are being done on the ground to, you know, help um, the church in Burundi, the Anglican church in Burundi, they planted millions of trees as one way of, you know, you know, contributing, you know, ways of how you could uh, preserve the environment. So that's an example. The, the other thing is that a number of other leaders also across the globe continue to do what they can. Uh, I think the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea also does a lot of teaching and helping the people in order not to contribute to further uh, you know, destruction of the environment. 
I think one thing uh, that the church could do more of is use that uh, platform that church leaders have, the pulpit, you know, where you're speaking into the daily lives of, of people in your community. Uh, there could be a lot more modeling uh, of environmental care and there could be a lot more teaching around the uh, uh, role of stewardship and what that means for us as individuals. There could be a lot more done on that. Great, look, thank you. Um, um, just a few maybe concluding remarks and um, um, thank you so much for these wonderful um, uh, presentations and for making the effort to come. I'll, I'll say a, a bit more about that uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, one of the tensions I see, um, uh, uh, Sarah, in your wonderful presentation of these eight uh, reconciling um, uh, principles or, or lessons learned or whatever, um, is that um, in places where there has been or is still real violence and bitterness in Su Sudan, Belfast, or w whatever, um, it, it's often... Um, uh, there's, there's the perception that the kind of reconciling mission is the kind of soft, fuzzy things that decent people do on the margins, mm -hmm. but that conflicts are driven by the hard men, mostly men, mm -hmm. um, and, that, um, and that trying to bridge that gap, you know, um, one of the most interesting slides I think he showed was um, uh, 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 where Republican and loyalist paramilitaries, people who had been hard men and had no doubt done some, you know, uh, terrible things, working with groups of um, Israeli and Palestinian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think that can be very valuable, you know, where there's a recognition that these are not the people who were sitting in the golf clubs or the country clubs away from what was going on, but were deeply involved and therefore have a, a certain credibility of both um, perpetrator and victim yeah. in situations. And, and how to, I mean, that was one of the challenges I found in, in certainly in, in, in Northern Ireland was how to bring these wonderful principles of justice and accountability and empathy and, um, and to, to make them, um, to, to, to give them teeth and energy and strength that they weren't the weak things while the tough people were sorting it out in different ways. And so I, I think that's one of the challenges that, that uh, all faith communities, I think, um, um, uh, face. But, um, um, but, um, uh, but I, I, I most wanted to say thank you both so much for um, taking the time out of busy schedules to come and spend uh, two full days with us, really, uh, um, uh, Bishop Anthony and um, uh, and Canon uh, Schneider have been uh, um, you know, doing workshops and, and answering questions and coping with jet lag and lack of sleep <laughs> and freezing cold and um, a million things. and. Um, uh, and we're just very grateful, not just that you've come, but grateful to know that there is a, a global religious communion with significant influence across the world in 165 countries, as you said, that really has made this a priority uh, of, its, um, uh, of its ministry in the world. And we wish you uh, all good things in that uh, um, mission and ministry. Um, both within the Anglican Communion and as you reach out to other faith traditions and to um, um, uh, political leaders across the world. So we're, we're delighted to um, uh, be able to share a little bit with what, what we're doing here at the Divinity mm -hmm. School in Wider it's Harvard exciting, really with uh, what you folks are doing. As we've discussed in, in our uh, private conversations, how um, many synergies there are and what we're uh, trying to accomplish. So um, I know that uh, we make many mistakes in this and that we still have limited understanding of uh, and, uh, and all of the rest of it. But um, uh, it is really encouraging for us to, to know that um, there are uh, people like you working in this um, uh, uh, field uh, so practically and, and so energetically. So. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us very much.
So be sure to check out the many relevant offerings of the organization that uh, co-sponsored tonight's event, the program negotiation at the law school. Uh, our next RPP colloquium is coming up in just two weeks on February 8th. It will fe feature Dr. Erica uh, Chenoweth of the uh, Josef Korbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver, presenting her research on why nonviolent civil resistance works and highlighting this power of spiritually engaged communities and movements for sustainable peace. So, uh, finally, I am going to ask Bishop Anthony if he would mind uh, uh, just closing in a very brief word of prayer for us and our, on our various uh, enterprises for peace. Okay. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us today to hear about peace and reconciliation. Your desire is that there will be peace throughout the world. And we pray that you would use the faith-based groups to bring peace, O oh Lord. Pray that they work together with governments and many others who also do what they can to have for peace. So that, Lord, many people who suffer in various parts of the world, their suffering is brought to an end. We thank you for the Harvard Divinity School and this program where we focus on bringing peace. Lord, we pray that you'll be with the dean and all those who work for peace. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for the two days that we have had together. And we pray for your blessings on each one of us. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.